Do you remember what you just did one half an hour ago with your hands? Maybe you typed a short text message, maybe you ate some chocolate. Some of you might have been at the washing rooms. The one or the other were picking his or her nose, maybe. When a person receives a lesion in the high spinal cord, the person will not be able from one second of the other to the other to move his or her leg, to stand, to walk, the person loses some of its vegetative functions, the person suffers from trunk instabilities. In a very high spinal cord lesion, the person will not be able to move his hand or her hands and arms anymore, even suffer from some breathing problems. The person suffers from a high spinal cord injury. One of the aims in, at my work at Graz University of Technology is to develop, to research a means to provide people with a means for restoring the arm and hand function for these people with high spinal cord injury. The vision of my research is the following. We want to read the intention of a movement, the motor intention, from the brain directly with the help of a brain-computer interface to provide a control signal or several control signals for a neuroprosthetic device which is able to restore movement again or to use a robotic arm instead. A brain-computer interface is a device which reads, records brain signals in Graz. We use the electroencephalogram. It's a non-invasive technology. We record brain signals. We use mathematical methods to extract features which describe these brain signals. And we use machine learning methods to find differences in those brain signals, in brain patterns, to provide a control signal. We do this for several applications but today I'm talking about the restoration of movement to drive a neuroprosthetic device. And when this device is working and hold the whole BCI, as we call it shortly, is working, we have a feedback. The person sees the arm moving and sees the, the thoughts get recorded directly and correctly. A neuroprosthetic device, we see this here is uh, based on uh, functional electrical stimulation. There are uh, electrodes attached on the arm, on forearm muscles, and by properly, um, by properly um, stimulating uh, these muscles, um, we can open the fingers, close the fingers, eventually move the thumb, eventually uh, move or turn the hand. Such a system is uh, not existing for the whole arm and therefore we are, uh, will use a, a robotic arm instead which is much easier to control. Let's do a small experiment together. Imagine a movement. Imagine you close your hands and open your hands. Just feel your fingers moving. Don't move them. Just feel your fingers moving squeezing a ball, or feel your feet coming up and going down. Um, just feel that. When you do that, then we will, you create a brain patterns specifically, um, on which we can uh, kind of make a visible on the brain surface, like we did with this movie here. So when a person is repeatedly moving the right hand on the left hemisphere, we see a, a pattern which we then detect with the brain-computer interface. These patterns appear on another place for the left hand, they appear on another place for feet, for example, by repeatedly imagining the movement. Back in the 2000s, we were doing a first proof of concept. And this person we see here is uh, having a high spinal cord injury, not able to control the hand 
but able to control the elbow of the left arm. The person was imagining foot movement, repetitively foot movements, until we were able to detect that signal to close his fingers around the glass so that he can grasp that. So we were doing this jointly with uh, Rüdiger Rupp from Heidelberg University. He is uh, my long-term collaborator since then, and we are working together. He is in the matter of uh, neuroprosthetics, and I am in the field of brain-computer interfaces. We did many studies since then, trying to, to find signals, proper signals for the elbow control, and so on and so forth. But we were not satisfied at all. All this repetitively imagining, and it's not working for a whole arm control. It's just simple too complex to do so. We want this. We want to try to find a method. Is it possible to make a proper, when we imagine or when we in, have an intention of that arm movement, are we able to record this, the brain signals and to generate this movement out of the brain signals only? And we want to do it non-invasively. Don't, we don't want to uh, go invasive directly to the brain. We want to attach just electrodes on this scalp. So, how does such a movement work? A roadmap to natural control. So when we want to grasp an apple in this fruit bowl, for example, we identify a goal first. Then we find out the apple which we want to grasp. We make a plan, we program, and finally we execute the movement. The arm is moving towards that apple, and finally we decide the correct grasp to take this apple. And then we have it, and then everything starts again to bring it uh, to the mouth. We can ask now several research questions. Um, and we did that in, uh, in, in uh, two European projects we are currently running. The first question is, when I do a movement, like I just did, is, did that movement have a goal or is, was it just a movement? Can I find out whether it's very specifically when I move somewhere or is it just something? I need that to start off, for example, my robotic arm to move. Otherwise, I don't know when to start. If that is solved, let's assume, we need to somehow decode from the brain signals the trajectory in 3D space from a person which does not move, of course. Uh, we want to find out when I do this, and I do this without moving, can I record, de decode that signals to make the arm move? And finally, and this is what we were investigating in Moorgrass project, are we able to detect the specific grasp, a cylinder grasp or a key grasp? Are we able to do detect a, a turn of the hand, for example. To the first question I, I asked, goal-directed movements. Is there a difference in brain signals, in neural correlates, as we call them, when I just move out or if I move specifically to something? The experiment showed the following nice results. We have here the area indicated where the hand is usually represented, below the position C3. And when we do this experiment, sometimes we have a goal in mind, sometimes we don't have a goal in mind, we record these brain signals, and what we find out, these very tiny signals, show a difference depending on whether a person has a goal or has no goal. We know this even before the movement starts off, which is very good for us because we can then start the robot moving or not. And this is even reflected in the whole motor areas which are necessary to start off a movement, which is shown in these uh, scalp maps uh, on the right side here. We do the next step. Uh, we talk about the decode, uh, decoding of trajectories next. It's a rather complicated setup, but I guide you through here. So we see a person with a resting hand on a platform, and we see a robotic arm here, which is a solid robotic arm. Um, the person uh, is seeing a target, like a worm, moving on the screen. And the person is asked to follow the worm uh, with his or her hand movement on the 2D space to start with. And the robotic hand, the robotic arm, uh, is, following that, is following that hand, following that worm. This is the solid robotic arm we see here in solid. At the same time we are recording brain signals, we have then, after the first experimental part, the hand movement recorded and the brain signals recorded. Then 
we build a decoder from the knowledge of the decoder, of the kinematics and the EEG signals. And then we use this decoder to read the EEG signals to drive the robotic arm, which is in a shadow here. So the person is first moving, and then uh, with the decoded signals, the robot, which is overlaid on this movie, uh, is, for, is moving too. So let's see that movie first. So we see the solid robotic is doing the same what the hand is doing, and the shadow robot is the result of only decoding the brain signals. What we see is not very perfect. The directions sometimes are very good. The amplitudes do not work yet. But it's a first start where we try to move a robotic arm just by decoding the brain signals, at least here in 2D space. We do now an experiment together. Because we have just seen this robotic arm worked, kind of, we do this for some years only, so we will have more years to work on that. It's not perfect yet, but sometimes these classifiers, these decoders will not be perfect, and the arm will do some movement which we will not like. And there, first we do an experiment together. So are you ready? I need your participation now. I send you a picture series here on that screen. It's a lot of animals. And whenever you see a string instrument, a violin, for example, then you clap your hands. Are you ready to go? Okay, let's move on. Perfect. <laughs> we talk about the principles of error processing, so some of you might have realized that you missed the violin to clap your hands. Did that work? So what your brain did, ah, there was a violin and it did not clap my hands. Error. This error signal can be read and can be classified, again, with a brain-computer interface. And we use this principle with another brain-computer interface at the same time, uh, finally, to correct a wrong movement, another experimental setup here. We see a person here moving the arm to the left or to the right, and the robot is following, following that arm. In this running field here, we see the classifier from the brain-computer interface. In the next trial, again, the person is doing well and the robot as well. But now the robot will do an error. It will make us another movement. The brain-computer recognizes that the person recognizes an error, correct it, and the person can move on. Error detected, recognized by the person and the BCI system, correct, and the person can move on. So the person saw, oh, the robot did the wrong movement, error signal, it was detected, and the robot received an undo command from us to go back down to continue the movement. So this is the principles we are also using to correct for this. We started first with a thing of uh, imagining the movements on the right hand, for example. This is very complicated and boring, especially in training. So what we do is now, and this is a new principle we are bringing into the field is that people just attempt a movement. And uh, the idea is here that people just do try once to open the hand, or as we can see on the left movie, or try to close the fingers to a key grasp, or do a turn on the hand. This means here we record many of these very short movement attempts, the person cannot move, we see it's a spinal cord injured person, is doing or trying this movement, record the brain signals, try a classifier, and then um, we can uh, use it uh, for uh, feedback. As we see in the right-hand side video, um, the person is now in a new situation. It sees the hand is resting in front of a spoon, and the person should attempt a key grasp, and when the brain-computer interface is able to detect that properly, the feedback shows you, I detected that properly. This is also working with the turn of that radial knob here, but here the person can move. So we try to, to bring the, the person's training into a more life, real-life scenario now with that. So we have an ongoing study in Morgrasp uh, where we have several of end users involved where we are in different states with these people at the moment. And the final uh, goal is to have the persons 
First, their muscles trained with the neuroprosthesis. The neuroprosthesis set up properly for the grasp the person would need. And the brain-computer interface set up after training. And then the person in this movie here tries to attempt or attempts a, a hand grasp. Um, one attempt only, this is the difference now, um, and when the brain-computer interface is able to detect that, then uh, the person is grasping that toothbrush here. So this is the first uh, preliminary data we are trying to, uh, to bring forward to these people. So the person here is high spinal cord injured, has remaining elbow movement but no hand movement. And the control of the fingers was done in this experiment with us. So to summarize, uh, we introduced new principles in the brain-computer interface area and field. Uh, instead of imagining movements, single attempts and trying to detect that, we are not perfect there, so we need to still improve our detection rate, especially in asynchronous situations. And for full 3D uh, control, we did many basic investigations. At the moment, we are moving onwards with our, uh, with our principles to very high spinal cord injured people to test them whether this is possible to control a robotic arm with the first tests in the, in the next couple of weeks. We start with that. I want to thank uh, many end users with high spinal cord injury who participate in our studies for now 20 years to help us in our research. And of course, I thank uh, all my previous uh, co-workers and, and PhD students and my current PhD students in the lab. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>